All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us, joining us on a Friday afternoon. Welcome to Icentia Conversations. This is a webinar all about communicating through change. I know that we've got some people in the session today who have been to all four of these webinars so far. For some of you, this might be your first session. I'll try and recap really quickly what our aim is with these sessions. We started this webinar series because we knew that something really big was going on in the world. We were all adapting to new ways of working. We were thinking about the best ways to communicate in this time of massive change. And I think it's really interesting today we're going to talk a little bit about how even, even this time of change is changing. We've seen, some of us have been working at home for about four weeks now, and the way that we might be feeling, the way that we might be working, and the best ways to communicate might be changing even within that period. So for the next half an hour, we're going to talk to the faces that you see on screen at the moment. I've got two guests in our session today. We're going to be talking to Rachel Clements, who is the co-founder and the national director for the Centre for Corporate Health. And the Centre for Corporate Health they work with organisations and part of what Rachel's work is with that organisation is creating psychologically safe workspaces. So that is a really interesting question. I can't wait to dig deep into that. What kind of risks do organisations, do communicators need to be looking out for during such a time of, of stress and anxiety and change? We've also got Nairi Crawford with us today, and Nairi Crawford is our Insights Director for Australia and New Zealand at Icentia. So that means she heads up our Media Research Division. And Nairi is also so passionate about communication and the measurement of communication. She's the chair of the Global Young Leaders Group for AMEC. So AMEC is the International Association for the Measurement and Education of Communication. So because Nairi and I are friends, that means that I can tease her and say, that she is a massive communications nerd. So I'm going to hand over to these speakers in just a second, but I did want to let you know that we'll have time for questions at the end of the session today. And we have muted all of your microphones coming into the session. I know that we're all doing a lot of video calls at the moment. I've seen people joke that not muting your mic is the new reply all to a company email. So we have muted your microphones for you, but we would absolutely love to hear any of your thoughts and we will have time for your questions as well. So if there's something that you'd like to ask Rachel or Nairi or ask all of us, you can do that via the chat area. If you want to spend a little bit more time on a certain topic, just let us know there as well. And if you're wondering where that chat area is, it is on the right hand side of your screen, just in that nav panel that comes up for GoToWebinar, the software we're using today. All right, awesome. What I'm going to do is hand over to Nairi. So Nairi, you've been doing these webinars with us for the last couple of weeks. You'll be a familiar face to some people who've joined today. What's changing? What are you noticing? Uh, the main thing is that we're all starting to get a little bit scratchy. Uh, and this is reflective in media coverage as well. Um, mostly you can see some of the shifts um, around lockdown restrictions, that longer term view on business and, and economic impact. And the big question of when is life going to be normal again? Um, if any of you are joining us from New Zealand, you'll, you will have really seen this tonal shift in media coverage over the last week, uh, simply because there's an element of everyone getting a bit scratchy, but there's also this kind of influx of uh, more, more formed opinions and other research that's starting to, to kind of rock the traditional crisis comms cadence of trying to get as much information out from official channels as possible. And now that there's those kind of counterbalances there, it does kind of feed into that things are a little bit scratchy. Um, and especially with the idea of moving up or down different alert levels and different lockdown conditions. Um, it's also really reflective in what people are Googling in this part of the world. Mostly people are looking at uh, what the restrictions are and what they are and aren't allowed to do. Um, and also starting to pick up a little bit more about misinformation. So there's a bit more Googling of um, particular drugs that have been claimed to be really effective, a bit more Googling of things like 5G and other fun theories. Um, 
so just really reflective of that people are starting to get a little bit antsy. Um, and yeah, social media, people are still being quite creative and looking to be innovative, but that undercurrent of stress and uncertain and uncertainty that I think I've mentioned in the last couple of weeks is certainly starting to pick up. Mm -hmm. Wanna to flip to the next slide, Ali? So to, to give you an idea of what people have specifically been worried about, um, and some of this is indicative of that switch from what I need to care about right now to what I need to start caring about in the future. Uh, people have been very concerned about bills and rent and, and mortgages and those really specific next, the next thing I have to pay. Um, we're seeing that starting to go down a little bit. And superannuation is actually the thing that people are becoming really, really worried about, which is reflective of this longer term, longer term view. Obviously, we can still see um, mental health and job losses and things like that coming through. Uh, really, the it being about individual um, bill payments rather than job losses themselves is also reflective of some of the support structures that are in place. Uh, so it's a bit more about your own personal income and how that's reduced rather than necessarily about job losses or business business strategies. If you want to flick to the flick to the next one, Ellie. Um, I'm obviously really excited to hear from Rachel today. So I've probably kept my bit a little bit shorter than normal, and but mostly because I wanted to reiterate a few a few points that I've been on about for the last couple of weeks. So for those of you that uh, have joined us on multiple weeks, um, I apologize, but sometimes there's a real benefit to hearing things twice. Um, the context of, of all of this environmental information uh, when you're communicating right now is incredibly important. Um, I know that as communicators, everyone wants to provide genuine and authentic communication. We all know that that is the most effective communication. Um, but at the same time, the best way to do that is to really understand who you're communicating to and what they're going through at the moment. Um, so yeah, know your audience and, and know the context of, of what it is that they're feeling. Um, audiences and businesses are really starting to get antsy about normality uh, and what future will look like and what that new normal is. Um, and it's important to listen. Uh, I think I've said a couple of times around adding additional sources to your information bubble even just some of the things that I've mentioned around uh, Google Trends, um, some of the other interesting interesting things to do is obviously to look at what's trending on Twitter, but also have a look at specific hashtags on uh, Instagram and particularly TikTok as well as the other one that is always worth having a look at, just so you can get a, re a like a quick flavour of what people are doing, what they're caring about uh, and what they're reacting to. Um, keep testing and seeking feedback with audiences. They're quite receptive at the moment because there's a lot of people with a little bit less to do um, and a little bit more time to time to occupy. Um, but just be conscious that that patience is really starting to wane. So just be conscious of what kind of responses you might get. Keep seeking out innovation. Um, the best way to do this is consider how you consume media and the types of things that you follow. I personally am very obsessed with dresses and buy way too many. But that means on Instagram, I follow a lot of designers. So I've been watching how they've incorporated social media into their design process for next year because they happen to be at home designing. So that's been that's been really interesting for me. Um, and yeah, continue to watch what drives those emotional responses. Uh, cancel culture and all of that stuff is incredibly fascinating. Um, you shouldn't take it too seriously, but it is a really good touch point on those things that will really quickly outrage an audience, um, which are usually indicative of kind of wider, wider social feelings. Uh, but yeah, that's that's it from me. So I'm going to hand over to hand over to Rachel now. Thanks, Nairi. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you today. What I thought would be uh, useful for me to share today is what we are seeing around, or particularly around the world in terms of the psychosocial risks that are impacting on us all currently in relation to COVID-19, and particularly some of the emotional journey and the wellbeing journey that people are actually going on right now. Because if we can understand a bit about what's happening emotionally for people, you can tailor communication according to the stage that they're in. So what I'm going to go through today is firstly just a bit of a, bit of a framework for actually understanding what some of those psych psychosocial risks are that we're seeing right now and, and we're thinking about for ourselves and our own teams as well a little bit of a framework for uh, how we might address some of those risks and obviously time at the end for some Q&A discussion so I think just to set the scene I'd like to just share with you what we are seeing now 
really in terms of some of the, the emotional journey that people are on with respect to COVID-19. We have really just designed a bit of a framework for this. And we've really consisted of it having three main stages. The first stage, which is where we were, and some, some of us are certainly still there now, is stage one, which is very much around, we were operating in flight and fight, we were operating in panic, fear, anxiety. So we were not taking in very much information. We were just kind of just trying to survive. We we're adjusting to working from home. We we're adjusting to new technology. We we're having to do pivots in our business. We were having to, you know, suddenly look at the media and, and be drawn into the fear contagion. So that first phase means that people are not taking in very much information at all. We would have to be very careful about how we're tailoring messages at that time. We are still seeing many people still in that phase, but starting to now come out of that phase, because I think we've been in that phase roughly for about six weeks, really, because there was a lot of fear and a lot of panic before everybody moved into social isolation. So what we're seeing now is this next phase, and I think particularly after the recent Easter break that we've had, people are actually now in phase two. Some people are in phase two, which I think is probably going to be the more challenging phase psychologically for people. I think it's where we've kind of come back and gone, right, this is our life now for a certain period of time. I don't know how long, uh, it's still unpredictable, it's still very uncertain. Now this is the hard yards. This is where we are kind of got to knuckle down now. And actually this is our reality for some time. So what we're, pre what we're seeing actually at the moment is a lot of disengagement, a lot of dissatisfaction, a lot of anger and irritability and frustration, and actually a term that we call languishing. Psychologically, languishing is akin to depression. If we're sitting in that stage where it's suddenly unmotivated, not satisfied, my effort doesn't make a difference, you know, and going into that languishing mindset, then our well-being can really take a toll. So we're seeing people now transitioning from the fear and the exhaustion of the fear into I'm tired, I'm sick of this, I might be so sick of this, I might even start to break those rules. I might even start to behave in ways that are opposite to what I'm being asked to do. Uh, and then we're gonna see people come into that stage three where people are actually going to adjust to that new normal. And as Nairi was saying, kind of have a little bit more optimism towards the future, get creative again, be able to think of you know, good solutions and ways forward, and maybe to look towards the future with a sense of optimism and hope. I think we'll be practicing hope a lot in stage three. Then I think stage four actually is when we get some of those freedoms back and then adjusting back to our old life is actually gonna take a little bit of time. So I just wanted to share those stages with you because I do think it's important when we're looking at how you communicate and the success of that depends on where somebody's at in that emotional journey and their readiness to take in information. So I thought I'd share with you some of those psychosocial risk factors that we're currently seeing out in our workplace environment. So what we, what we saw eventually, you know, recently was that about six weeks ago, when all of this was really starting to emerge and quite change quite rapidly, there was a lot of panic, a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety. Suddenly we took everyone who was in a very anxious state and we made them socially isolated. So that made people a whole lot worse. So what we were certainly seeing in our, our work, in our consulting practice, was people that had had any pre-existing mental health conditions, particularly anxiety and depression, were certainly at risk of exacerbation. We have seen people using a lot of drugs and alcohol to cope with that fear and that anxiety that people were in. Um, and obviously what we see is the pre-existing circumstances. You know, life goes on. Life doesn't stop. If I was going through a relationship breakup, if I was going through a tough time financially, if I was going through um, a challenging time with one of my kids, those pre-existing things don't stop, they continue on. So what we're noticing is that people's capacity then to deal with those external stressors at this time of increased pressure has been eroded a little bit and people are struggling with that. Obviously the significant impact on family dynamics where we're seeing a huge amount of stress coming from I'm expecting myself to do exactly the same amount of work in my high performing, high achieving job. And now I've maybe got the whole family working from home. Maybe I'm being a full time uh, teacher as well, while I've got my kids at home. Maybe I'm um, feeling as if I'm failing. We're seeing a lot of feelings of guilt, a lot of people extending the day. And what we see in that phase two I spoke about was actually burnout. Burnout from trying to keep up with the family dynamics when one's personal and one's work life actually collides.
So we're still seeing people struggling to adjust their expectations around, right, maybe now I need to do the best job I can possibly do and I might need to let go of this or this, that inability to adjust one's mindset to that changing circumstance has been causing a lot of stress. People are going in there with their old mindset into a completely different situation that we've never ever been in before and it's not a normal situation, it's not a usual situation, so people are actually struggling with that. And of course, I know you've touched on this pre in previous sessions, sadly the increased rate of family and domestic violence has escalated. We do know that one in three women and one in nine men are impacted by family and domestic violence, and sadly that has exacerbated at these times where we've obviously been forced into social isolation and um, people finding themselves in, you know, increased um, levels of hostility in that regard. We're also seeing frontline risks. I mean, we are working with a lot of people on the frontline right now, whether it be people in banks, we do a lot of work with retail as well. So people like in Coles and you know people who are on the frontline and their major risks is coming into contact with the general public on a regular basis. So they've had real concerns around health risks, which has fueled a lot of that fear and that anxiety. They're watching the general public a few weeks ago in absolute panic, buying up all the toilet paper, you know, raiding all the shelves, taking all the medication, all those sorts of things. That has settled down a lot now as we come out of the fear stage and into more of that kind of languishing stage now. Uh, but still coming into contact with pub the public is obviously something and people are very sometimes disappointed in how they've seen the members of the general public behave at these times quite unrationally or maybe selfishly and kind of looking after themselves. We're seeing people obviously having a huge emotional load to their work. So if I am, uh, if I do work in a bank, usually I'm doing some pretty task focused things, processing money, dealing with transactions, whereas now my role is not transactional. I'm hearing distressing stories all the time. I'm helping people in need. I'm, um, I'm fearful for my own health. So there's a lot of emotional load that's going on and it's exhausting for people right now. Obviously that fear of infection, you know, is, is a very big one as well. In terms of the employment kind of risks that we're seeing across the board as well, and Nairi were kind of was alluding to this before about the incredible uh, financial pressure now as we head into a bit of an economic downturn. People are very concerned around their job loss, job loss or job security, um, their financial positions currently, um, obviously increase in financial pressure. We're seeing also a lot of workload challenges currently. Some people's workload has gone through the roof. They are so busy and they are just trying to play catch up constantly. So they've got this load of their personal life and this huge load of their work life, which in some of our clients are actually working double, they're double the workload. Uh, pretty much just to keep up with the demand and trying to balance all of that has been pretty hard. That loss of direction, feeling as if, oh, you know, I'm not quite sure uh, where my career is going right now. I feel a little, little bit of a loss of, I feel a bit isolated, um, feel a bit of decrease in that motivation. I feel as if I'm maybe not as satisfied. I'm not sure exactly that uncertainty. And the risk of that is that we need to keep our teams very motivated, particularly in phase two, to avoid the risk of, of languishing, to avoid the risk of demotivation and, and job dissatisfaction, of course. We're also seeing actually a new risk emerging, an, an oh and risk of people working from home. So a lot of people are kind of saying, look, I don't even know if I can kind of really do my job properly when I'm working from home. I was hearing from one client that they said their biggest challenge right now is getting their employees to actually do their job because some of them are refusing. They're saying, oh, I don't have all the equipment at home. It's not exactly as my setup is at work. So I'm actually not going to, going to work as much as I normally do. So that's kind of what we see in that languishing state, which leads to, you know, very, um, you know, unproductive kind of teams at this time. So this is a basically just a quick summary of everything that we are seeing playing out now. So I would say from a wellbeing perspective, we are struggling with different aspects of it. So we were struggling with the fight or flight reaction, fear and panic. Now I think we're going to be struggling with depression and sadly, the prediction of increased uh, rates even of suicide. Um, stage three, I think we'll come out of that a bit more and into a bit of more of a positive stage of that hope and that optimism. We are actually also seeing increased incidents of incivility and aggression. So people are just not being as tolerant of one another 
and not kind of allow, not being kind to oneself or one another, and that's kind of coming out in terms of aggression or incivil kind of behaviour. I'm working with a lot of groups right now where they're getting customer calls from their customers saying, "Hey, I need some adjustments to my plans that I was on," and getting you know a lot of abuse. So I've been doing some work with them about how do you comment, how do you communicate effectively with people, and they've never had this in their history. They've never had to develop these skills because their clients have always been really lovely. But in times of stress, that aggression that anger and that frustration, particularly in phase two when we're contained like this for a long time, people, it goes against the grain. As humans, we don't like to be contained. So the risk is that we do the opposite. We start to act out and we start to um, you know, verbalise that and we start to do the opposite of things that we're actually asked to do. So from a wellbeing perspective, we've just got to keep wellbeing on the radar because I, I have to say, there's never been a better time to be communicating um, you know, really well around um, early prevention or well, the strategies that actually can prevent people from sliding down that slope of mental health issues, getting in early, being able to have some of those conversations. And I've got a little just summary of what some of those strategies are on the next slide. Um, so getting really good within our teams at firstly doing a little bit of a risk assessment on our teams. What, and this will be individual, what workplace and personal psychosocial risk factors do we have in our team? Do I know that I've got somebody going through a rough time personally, somebody that maybe is experiencing a mental health issue or they had that before, or maybe they've just had the death of a family member or whatever it might be. Really keeping an eye on what are those psychosocial risk factors we may have, it, have as a team, that connectivity, that communication, People are hungry for all of that at the, moment, at the moment. So the more ways we can communicate, it might even sound like a broken record, but people are not taking it in as much as they normally do. So you may find yourself repeating exactly the same messages. To you, it sounds like you're doing it again and again, but to that other person, they're hearing it again for the very first time. Trying to develop new routines. People do better with routine, and we're trying to you know, really encourage people to find new routines themselves to boost that level of um, control and comfort and confidence again. Supportive leadership is massive. Being visible, even though we're distant, um, physically is a massive predictor of very good, you know, psychological wellbeing. If we've got that great supportive leader, it predict up, predicts up to 60% of employee wellbeing. Getting good at spotting the signs remotely of poor mental health. Getting good, and I know you've done this before, getting good at having those are you okay conversations that Catherine would have spoken to you about recently getting good at managing and getting onto any high risk responses that we might see emerging in the next little while. And if there, do, if there is opportunity for employee assistance program support or other support through other organisations such as Beyond Blue or Lifeline, just even making you know, people aware of what systems and support is in place. Um, and people don't necessarily have these, these skills. Um, so a lot of the time now we're actually doing a lot of webinars ourselves around anxiety reduction, supportive leadership, you know, working remotely, communicating in difficult situations. So um, I, th I think there's one more slide to, to go over just as a summary of what those support services are and just to make sure that people know what they are because this is a challenging time for people's mental health. We are already seeing mental health issues skyrocket and we've only been in this situation for six weeks and we know there's a long way ahead of us. But through wonderful communication, wonderful, close, supportive relationships, we can actually head off a lot of people from going down that poor mental health path. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was that was really interesting. I feel like this week has been one of my my harder weeks. I feel like we all have ups and downs and some of what you've been sharing about, oh God, this is really where we're at for a little while. I'm looking forward to see it, that hope stage coming around. <laughs> so for everybody on the session, we've got time for questions now. And like I said before, you can ask those questions in the chat area on the, the panel over to your right. And we can, I'll make sure that Rachel and Nairi see those questions. I think I had one question for you, Rachel, and I might have one up my sleeve for you as well, Nairi. So you were talking before about how some people right now might still be in phase one, some people might be in phase two, some people might, might already be starting to see that road out or feeling that hope. 
whether whether you're communicating internally or whether you're communicating to to stakeholders or or customers do you do you have any recommendations for how you can kind of blend or target messages that that are for all three groups because you're not necessarily going to know who is who is where i know and and it, it it's it's interesting to think about because because those stages are a little bit similar to the grief cycle, you know, in terms of they're kind of a little bit where because we are grieving a little bit of our loss of life or loss of income and loss of a whole range of different things. Um, you know, ideally, if somebody is in what we call their emotional brain, which for a lot of us, we are in our emotional brain. And sure, they're different emotions. So we've got the emotions of stage one, fear, anxiety, the emotions of stage two, languishing, depression, um, demotivation, the emotions of stage three, positivity, optimism, hope. So when people are in the negative emotion, their brain is actually shutting down. So the studies from neuroscience tell us and show us that we are not taking in information. So I'd be making your communication pretty short, pretty simple, pretty sharp. And as I said before, you may find yourself repeating that type of information as well. You'll be able to tell which stage people are in because if they're starting to say comments are a lot more worrisome, a lot more self-doubting, a lot more frustrating, how long are we going to be in this situation? This is getting really hard right now. As soon as people go into negative emotion, their brain is literally shutting down. So their capacity for communication is pretty low. Whereas when people are engaged in positive emotion, the hope, the optimism, the looking forward to the future, and I think that will come with some of these restrictions are eased. That's where people, the messaging can get a little bit more advanced. It can get a little bit more sophisticated. People are going to be in a completely different frame of mind. And we know that when people are in states of positive emotion, their whole brain expands, their prefrontal cortex opens up and they can take in information. When people are in mm -hmm. negative emotion, they tend to take in the negative, their negative information. So you might be trying to present something or communicate and the only thing that they've actually taken in is that maybe a little twist on, on a word or a phrase or something a bit negative and they'll pick that up. So our brain will selectively process the communication. So you do have to be careful and be very mm. clear of your communication and your message. Otherwise, we'll do that selective bias. And the only information I'm going to pick up is something negative that you said or a little tone of voice or a little look on your face and I'm suddenly going to spiral into that negative emotion. Yeah, you mentioned before that that maybe these stages could be a little bit like the stages of grieving. And one of the questions that has come through has asked within those stages, can people move back and forth? Can you have yeah. a, a phase yeah. two day and a phase three day? <laughs> Absolutely. I think that's a great question because uh, we're, we're all going to be going through these phases very in individually. And I think it is a a um a daily a daily thing really i think um now stage three is actually coming in like i am seeing a little bit more hope than i was just before easter which was only like a week ago so i yeah. think yeah i do think it's a daily change in state it's yeah. a very fluid very fluctuating state Awesome. We've got another couple of questions coming through, which is fabulous. Rachel, this is one for you. You spoke about the importance of visible leadership and yep. that 60% linked to employee engagement. Uh, Rupert yep. Hugh Jones is wondering a little bit about what visible leadership can look like in a working from home context. Is it is it as simple as, as being visible on a video call? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. We really are encouraging people at the moment about, you know, visibility, getting a, a, a vision. Because when we actually, the research from neuropsychology shows us that to get the benefit of connectedness, especially at this time, you actually have to see someone. You actually have to see their facial expression. A lot of the research has been done actually on the eyes. So if you mm. can see someone's eyes, you will get benefit from connectedness. You're going to release oxytocin in your brain. So the research shows that we don't release as much oxytocin through a text or through an email or through maybe picking up the phone and just talking to someone. So the visibility is looking at creative ways that I can be visible when I'm distant. It could be looking at, and we like to see everybody in our team once a day. Somewhere, someone has to actually visibly see one someone are they looking disheveled are they looking okay are they looking happy are they looking worried because when people start to decompensate in their mental health 
they'll start to avoid that. They'll start to shut that down. They'll start to hide behind that. Oh, sorry, I can't get my camera working today, so I'm not going to appear. So really keeping an eye out for that. I would say visible, absolutely, at, at, at least once a day, um, and and supportive leadership. So those just regular check-ins, not just about work, but the research shows now it's about checking in with people's well-being. You know, you've had a busy day. I can see you've been really busy. Just want to check in. How are you? How are you going with this? How are you? How are you coping at the moment? And just building in those well-being conversations on a regular basis makes mm. it okay for someone to speak up if they're not travelling so well. Awesome. I've got a couple more questions in the question area. If you have a question as well and you're listening in, pop that through. We've got time for a couple more if we're being a little bit sneaky. So. Rachel, do you think, this is a question coming through from Alison, do you think we need to do some work as a society to develop resilience? Alison yeah. has been a little bit surprised at how difficult some people have found this lockdown. Yeah, yeah I agree. I mean, look, the research shows that we haven't really been through any particular challenging time. If you're probably what, less than about 42, you probably don't even remember the recession that we had you know, way back kind of in the 90s. So the research does show that for people who are younger than about 42, um, particularly younger generation, are much less resilient than what we were 20 years ago. So that's a very common theme in the literature. And that's why we do a lot of work with graduates, for example, when they're starting out in their careers. So when they're in their early 20s, they are very low on resilience, incredibly low. So we see corresponding high mental health rates. So that's where, you know, we, we do a lot of mental resilience training throughout all age groups and it just means that people have never learned these skills because how we learn these skills is actually going through adversity, going through challenges, going through a tough time and this probably is many people's tough time. People may not have ever been through an economic downturn before and that's where you actually develop those skills and harness those skills of resilience. So I think it makes perfect sense of people actually struggling to cope with it because they really, sometimes people have not developed the muscle of resilience yet because they haven't been through very much adversity. And even we're noticing that in our team where I say, I can't believe someone asked about, you know, asked this question in this, in this type of environment. People are like, remember, they've never been through a tough time globally before. Um, so it's a kind of a different frame, but I would agree people are struggling. We, people, common theme in the literature, we're lower on resilience than we were 20 years ago. Hmm, interesting. Nairi, this is a question for you and then maybe we've got time for one more and then it's probably time to cut these off. So Nairi, you mentioned that people are, are scratchy at this time. For communicators, should we be tailoring our, our, our messages with the knowledge of this? Maybe there is some sensitivity or do you think it's still BAU for communicating right now in this scratchy time period? I think, I mean, I am a fan of tailoring communication for the context. I think it has the best, the best cut through and the best result. Um, it's also, it's something people remember. It's hard to, in a time like this, and well, in any kind of crisis, it, it's really easy to just, everything's this constant flow of information and you don't really pay attention to a lot of it. But there'll be these funny little things that anchor you and that you'll remember. And a lot of that time, a lot of the time it's, it's when someone's done something that you're like, oh, that's really nice. Or, oh, that makes a lot of sense. So it's, I, I'm a big, big fan of that. So I think other than being really clear and concise at the moment when there's a lot of, a lot of information out there, I think I'm a fan of being really open about what you think people are going through and, and talking, talking to your audiences like you understand them and that you're also that you're interested to know how they feel. I think there's a, there's a real benefit to that. Mm. Does that resonate with you as well, Rachel, for communicating with people who are in those phases right now? Yeah, I mean, I'm doing a lot of training with people around empathy and just, you know, empathy, listening to your clients, listening to your teams, inquiry, genuinely asking people how are they, how they're going and being present because I think communication, sure, the words that you say are important and they carry some weight, but I think it's so much more important the energy you bring to these conversations, the care factor, 
the empathy that you bring, the energy that you carry into this conversation, that's where you make the difference with people. People can hear in your voice that you are very caring, you're concerned about them, you're here to support. And I can't tell you what that feels like. If you're internally anxious and you've got a lot of those psychosocial factors going on, to hear someone who's calm on the other end of the phone or, or on a video chat, to be able to say, right, that person sounds in control, they sound calm, they're inquiring how I am. At these tough times, that just speaks 10 times more than what it ever did in our kind of normal kind of world. So I think just taking the time, being genuinely kind to other people, taking the time to inquire about their well-being, how they're going, is going to speak volumes. And without you even knowing it, you can be heading off a mental health issue for somebody without you even knowing it, just the way that you have related and what you have brought, the energy you have brought to that communication situation can actually sometimes save someone from spiraling out of control. And, mm. you know, the profound difference without you even knowing it. Yeah, I think a lot of what we've shared today has really resonated with people. We've got some some comments in the questions area saying that it really makes sense, that it's a journey of stages. People have been struggling because of the unknown duration of the period and it, it's hard to shape that messaging when so much is unknown. Um, also people saying, realizing how important visibility is. Some people saying they're definitely gonna do more video calls has come through there as well. So I know that we've, started having a really interesting chat and we've gone a little bit over time because we've gotten stuck into those questions. There are some uh, contact details up on screen now for Rachel, but you should have my email. So if you don't have time to get this down, just drop me a line if that's something that you'd like more information on or you'd like a link through to those work, the, the work that the Centre for Corporate Health does into mental health, mental toughness and well-being. We've fully done the questions. That's definitely all we've got time for today. Thank you so much, Nairi. Thank you so much, Rachel, for sharing some of your wisdom with us today. I think it was just what I needed to hear this week. We're going to be doing this webinar session again on Friday next week. We're going to have something a little bit different next week. We've got Helen McMurdo from MTV and she's going to be talking about her Alone Together campaign and tips for connecting with younger audiences during this time. I know Nairi said something about TikTok before. So if we're talking about younger audiences, I imagine we'll have some TikTok content next week as well. Thank you everybody so much for tuning in today. I hope you have a lovely weekend. Be kind to yourselves, be kind to each other and see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody.